It's a really rare treat to have all of you together, not in the same room, but on the same Zoom call. Um, so we very much appreciate it. So let's dig in. Um, what do you think about being known as the founding mothers, of course, along with Cokie Roberts, the much beloved and missed Cokie Roberts? Well, if Cokie, if Cokie could have been here, she would have been, and I know that WFAE tried to get her, but the, the travel restrictions were just too great. Anyway, I think it's great since it's, I, I coined the term. I was getting a little tired of how everybody was founding father, and as because I happened to have been a, a young mother in those days, I made us all mothers. And I think it, really, <laughs> it caught some attention, and it has a little bit of humor to it. And it's remained true. And when did you start thinking about yourselves as the founding mothers? Well, I was one of the first of us to be hired. I was one of the very first employees at NPR to be hired. When I was, when they brought me on board, they had a room to meet in, in a space they had rented, but they didn't have any chairs. So we had a meeting and we all sat on the floor. Uh, and I mean, I, I hope you don't have to get any more founding than that. <laughs> took a while to get well, I, founding mothers is fine as long as they don't call us founding grandmothers i'm happy uh, that's all right. <laughs> well so when you when you first joined npr was it did you believe in public radio or was it just a, a job in journalism oh i certainly believed in it i'd already been working at it at a local station very much like yours which has interestingly enough become one of the powerhouses of the system, it's uh, WAMU in Washington, DC. It's on the American University campus. And I've been doing that for a number of years, for a while, mostly because the station manager left. I was the manager of that station and I wasn't very good at it. Uh, but I wasn't good at very much in those early years. All I knew was I was in love with this medium. And so uh, the whole notion of creating public radio and being in on the beginning of it was quite thrilling to me. But the others have different, Linda has far more uh, professional experience than I <laughs> Well, I have a huge amount of public radio experience with the mother of all public radios, the BBC. Yeah. I went to work for the BBC right out of college. And it was, um, I had to spend a little time in New York working as a temp in order to uh, get together the money to pay my fare to London, but other than that, um, I worked for the BBC and was very impressed with uh, you know, with what public radio was like in Great Britain, no commercials, of course. And also there were just a tremendous amount of people who, of women working for the BBC. And I, you know, I researched why this had happened by interviewing all these women. And they all told me the same story. The job I have now, they would say, what well, was held by, you know, Mr. Tweedle, and he went to war. And I, they put me in this job. And he didn't come back, poor man. And so I still have this job. Mm -hmm. I mean, the women got in because there weren't any men in London to hire. And so women who had been working in backstage roles stepped up to the front of the stage. And the thing is that they were all very good and uh, nobody wanted them to leave. They liked it. Mm. Well, I was a print reporter. I was not a broadcast reporter. Um, and at some point, uh, and I, I had covered the Supreme Court and I'd won a lot of awards for it. And the bureau chief at NPR, and you, when I say the bureau chief, the Washington, the guy who ran the Washington office, which was really almost all of NPR's news operation, decided that he, that they needed a, a legal affairs correspondent, not just the Supreme Court, but other things too. And um, he recruited me. Now, of course, when you ask why we worked for NPR, in part because they were willing to hire us and they were willing to hire us for almost no money. And that's why we had such a stellar cast of women because no men would work for the money we made in the beginning. And most of us That's true. Them. That's what, remember Frank Mankiewicz's uh, wonderful statement, you know, why do you have so many women working at NPR? 
He said, because you get more bang for the buck with women. Oh, adorable. <laughs> today he'd get a lawsuit. Darling. Hey, he'd get fired. <laughs> get a lawsuit. No, but another real reason they could, we could afford to do it because most of us, many of us, were married. And so there were two salaries mm -hmm. in the One house. Married. And, and uh, we could afford, the household was able to afford our getting so little money because there was a second salary there. But it had a wonderful uh, side, other side to it, which was that we had tremendous opportunities because of that. And we could have real power there. Uh, and it was know, get on the air rare fabulous in the room stories. from the 1970s, and, right? I mean, that was, yeah, that really stood out. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were covering, I mean, a lot of these realms that you were covering were very male dominated at that time. Um, you know, no kidding. Right? Yeah, Congress, um, the court system. Did you have any tactics for trying to get men who may be skeptical of um, women in journalism to open up and, and speak to you? I just think we, we were willing to work harder to be better. That was the only way we were going to succeed back then. It's very hard for this generation of young women to understand that most of us had been the only woman or one of two women where we had worked in our earliest careers. That's not true for Linda at the Beeb, but it was certainly true for me in every print. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the only way I figured I was going to succeed, and I was, I was not married when I went to work at NPR, I was supporting myself. I just figured I had to be better and spend more hours at it. And in candor, I spent more hours at it than I do now. Uh, you know, I just, I just, I, I just understood that this was a very tall mountain to climb, and there was only one way to climb it, and that was step by step. But you were really asking whether there was some resistance to us as women, whether they had a problem getting men to talk to them for stories. I was, I'm the first woman to have anchored a, a national nightly news broadcast and learned years after I had begun that there was quite a bit of uh, protest from our member stations uh, because they felt a woman didn't sound authoritative and wouldn't be taken seriously in delivering news. Now those were the days when it was, we were on a telephone line which wasn't the highest quality. So it may have distorted how we sounded. I was always a smoker, so I had this deep voice. But, uh, but still, it was, mostly, it was mostly about that. And it took a while, really, for people to get used to this sound and to be able to tolerate it and then really enjoy it, like it, and listen to it. Ms. Susan, There's a, one, one of the things that happened where I was was that uh, I, I was talking to politicians. And you know they don't see the human being. They just see the microphone. <laughs> and they see all of the people that are listening. And as NPR got to be, you know, better known and, and much more listened to, I didn't have any of that kind of difficulty. Um, there were I, there were times when I had to get in and, you know, go, go with all with elbows flying because the guys at the office felt that the person to interview the Speaker of the House or the leader of the Senate was probably them. And I had to get in there and defend my turn. Mm. So yeah. the bigger obstacles were at the news organizations themselves at times. Well, sometimes. Like. That's absolutely right. Yeah. They had no idea whether this was going to work or not. But one of the things, one of the things in any organization that it's, it's, you know, it's sort of right out there in front in news organizations was that men in a, in a news organization tend to want to replace the people in the culture with other people who are just like the people who left. And so, you know, that's men. Mm. And they, it was a very, it was, that was just, that was the most basic and ridiculous and difficult thing to overcome. Well, and they all have pals. They all have pals and younger pals that they thought would be just sure. perfect. And yeah. they were white guys. And these guys are just like me. We had to develop me. an old they girl's be wonderful. And we did. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Stamberg, you were talking about this different sound and yeah, having women on the forefront of that different sound was right. a huge part of the difference. But, you know, also speaking to people as though, you know, they're your neighbor, your, yes. your friend, that conversational quality. And there's, um, you know, one of the things that I think was, you know, you've always been known for your, for your warmth, for example, and, um, 
right from the get-go. Now, I'm going to play a, uh -oh. a clip from 1979. So this, okay. been, you'd been at the job for several I'm years. a little older by then. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is when you did a live broadcast from the Oval Office yeah, all-in show Carter. with President Carter. So let's just right. listen to this. All right. Good afternoon, President Carter. It's good to have you with us. This is a format that you enjoy a lot, isn't it? This uh, radio telephone business. It's it is. I've not only done it here in the Oval Office, but uh, for instance, when I went down the Mississippi River on a paddle wheel steamboat, that's right. We stopped and had a telephone call-in show. And that kind of warmth, I think, is just really unusual for people to hear early on, especially in the '70s. But what did it take, you know, as you were starting out to kind of think through that and think through what the NPR sound should should be? Well, well I give you two reasons. One was Bill Simmering, who was the sort of the prophet who, you know, told us all what we were going to do. He wanted us to sound like regular people. And he didn't hire people who didn't sound that way. For the most part, well, there were some exceptions, but for the most part, he hired people who, of whom the audience would have no expectation that they would be the voice of God from the mountaintop. Um, and most of us were, were not only unwilling to do it, but possibly not even capable of doing it. Yeah, I and, will say, oh, sorry, go ahead, finish. And I think that that, I think that, that, was, a, that was one of the big beginning differences between the way NPR sounded and other places. In fact, you know, our listeners told us that they would be driving around in the car and they would be away from their home radio station and they would start looking for it and they would find it like that. Very easy to find because it sounded saw it. Yeah. different. Yeah. But, you know, this goes back to being the first woman. Um, I had no role models as there were no other women doing what I was doing. So I figured what you do is you imitate the men. And I spoke in a deep authoritative voice for quite a while. And Bill came <laughs> up to me. <laughs> Did you like it? I'll do it more. Yeah. Bill came up to me and he said, and these were the most valuable words maybe anyone has ever said to me in my life, be yourself. Now, who in this world tells you that except Fred Rogers? Nobody. They say, fix your hair or get a different dress or wear a different color or, yeah, get rid of those stripes, whatever. But he said, be yourself. And it was like this enormous permission. He had our sounds, the sound that he wanted in his head. Well, the other thing is that radio, it's really, it's such an intimate meeting. Yeah, yeah. people you're, in the show. You're in the studio. Most of the time, unless you're doing a live two-way with a, with a host, in my case, or a host is doing it with me or somebody else, you're, it's you alone with a microphone and, and the audience. And the audience is also more or less alone. They're in the car, they're making dinner, they're doing tasks where their hands are busy, but they want their mind to do something at the same time. And, and it's a... It's a, I, in that sense, it's a, I love the medium. And what's interesting about it is the more you do it that way, the more you feel that you're in it like a cocoon. And when, whenever we have hired television reporters, and we've had some wonderful, wonderful ones come to NPR, but the thing they had to learn to do was not to shout. Because in television, you're competing with the video and they were told to talk loud so that people would hear you over the video. Well, and you know, the first, the real shouter I remember was Koki when she first came. They had been living in Greece and she had been doing, was it CBS uh, radio yeah. then? And so when she came, I mean, she had coaxial cable or something across the ocean and she shouted, she shouted. And we had to, I remember I did and maybe you did too, take her aside and say, you know, you, don't you, know. you really <laughs> will be there. There she is, yeah. And so she, very, you know, she was a quick, lear a quick learner, and she lowered her voice, um, modified her tone, as my father used to say to me. <laughs> well, so, so take us back to the NPR newsroom of the 1970s. I mean, you had in 1972 the Watergate scandal breaks. Dixon resigns in '74. Saigon falls in '75. Jimmy Carter becomes president. At least. In the beginning, I mean, there were 65 people on staff 
Right. Five yeah. reporters. Only five, yeah, only five, five reporters. reporters. You know, call, covering all that for a daily show, how did you do it? God, there was we only one then. All the time. <laughs> I mean, we, we never stopped. Yeah. I can remember during uh, Watergate, I mean, I don't, I don't think I slept very much at all during that whole process. And, uh, and still, you know, I was so concerned that uh, we had, we had one, one woman who came down to the studio, to the, to the hearing room in the House Judiciary Committee one day preparing to, you know, she wanted to get in on the act. <laughs> and I was so tired. I thought, you know, I could have just, I was stretched out on the floor, I would have gone to sleep. But I still had, you know, I was still ferocious enough that I said, you're not doing this. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> and, you know, and that was, that was Watergate. But um, you also, you know, were notably, uh, Ms. Wertheimer, one of the, the, the first person to broadcast live a Senate debate from the, uh, the, the floor, the Senate floor. And this was, um, we're going to play a clip clip now. This was uh, going back to the Panama, Panama Canal Treaties back in 1978 when they were discussing this. So let's take a let's take a listen to that real quickly. From National Public Radio in Washington, the Senate debates the Panama Canal Treaties. Today is the first time in our 200 year history that the debates in the Senate will be heard far beyond the chamber and its visitors gallery. And that was a weeks long process. I believe that was 10 weeks, but I mean, the hustle that was involved during those times just seems like it was um, pretty tiring and exhausting, as you were saying. But I mean, it also was, was starting to put NPR on the map as well. Yes, I think it did. And one of the things that, you know, the Senate debate is not really very interesting. And especially now they don't have any debate. But they, uh, but they, but they were aware that their constituents could hear it. And so I think they put a little special effort into making it more lively than it might otherwise have been. But you know, I, I mean, I'm old enough, obviously, to remember that the United States of America had never done anything of this sort, given away a piece of real estate that we owned, the Panama Canal. And people were outraged, they were horrified. One of the funny, one of the things that I remember was that Robert Siegel was, Robert Siegel was invited to a dinner at the Panama Embassy, and uh, he, they told him a story about how the the leader, the country's leader, uh, was listening to the Senate debate, and he'd listen to it and he'd get just furious at the dreadful things that people were saying about Panama, and how Panama was too stupid and too too little and too dinky to run something big like the Panama Canal. And then he said, the, the man would, he would, uh, he would jerk the radio out of, a, out of its plug and throw it out of the window. <laughs> and then he would call for, uh, and then, and, you know, one, two, three, four, and then he would call for another radio <laughs> so I could listen to it some more. It was, it was quite an adventure. Mm. You know, both of these women were my models because, I, as I said, I was a print reporter and I would, I really didn't know what I was doing. I'm lucky I have a, a nice voice and I had a, a talent for writing a narrative, but I really was clueless. And when I look back, I remember one day Susan Stamberg saying to me, don't cover your mouth. <laughs> Sitting there like this, you know, and then talking. Don't, don't, don't cover your mouth. <laughs> really clueless. Probably the best advice I ever gave you, Nina. <laughs> well, I mean, going to that, I mean, right. So you had, you know, you were having interviews that that were broadcast, and um, you know, also going back to the tone of this, not yelling into the mic, right? Right. But you know. Let's take a listen. There's an uh, interview in 1979, Ms. Totenberg, that you did with John Ehrlichman. He's the former Nixon, the, the advisor to Nixon, who was convicted of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and perjury. Um, and you interviewed him a few years after, after that. Um, is it me you, or, or Totenberg? This is, this is Ms. Totenberg, yeah. Okay. He was and, probably peddling his book. Yeah, he was, he was selling <laughs> books. Well, you 
you were quiet and persistent. And this is just a, a short clip of that. If you know in your heart of hearts that you are defending a situation that is at best difficult, uh, has many problems to it. You mean in the trial or in no, the, at the in, hearings? at the hearings. Well, at the hearings, I did not. But you'd already appeared before the grand jury, and it was perjury before the grand jury of which you were convicted. I did my best to correct the record before the grand jury. And it goes on, but, you know, I think interviews like this are just a reminder of, you know, how many combative and powerful people, this wasn't too combative at that point, but combative and powerful people that, you know, who were surely quick to tell you um, off um, that you had to deal with. And yet I think all of you are known for having a knack with dealing with these people. And, you know, Ms. Totenberg, I was thinking of a time, you know, when you broke the Anita Hill accusations against Clarence Thomas and you went on Nightline with Senator Alan Simpson um, and people <laughs> destroying Hill's life and then confronted you in the parking lot trying to block your exit and you had some choice words for him. Um, but you two became friends and maybe that's an extreme example but you know that really indicates an act for this and how how do you navigate difficult relationships like Look, i covered the judiciary committee i i could not afford to have alan simpson who was one of the senior members of the judiciary committee be permanently angry with me it's my job to cover the judiciary committee so i made an approach to him i got nowhere and ultimately, it was his daughter and his wife who just coincidentally, his daughter was at a, something where I spoke. And I said, I had said in passing that one of the things that I don't like about being a reporter is that inevitably there are people who are really mad at you and really dislike you intensely. And I'm no different than anybody else. I like to be liked. And it's very unpleasant. And, um, and Susan Simpson came up to me and she said, Ms. Totenberg, I'm Alan Simpson's daughter and I like you. And <laughs> it, was not long, it was not long thereafter that I um, invited him to go with me to the radio and TV correspondence dinner. And his daughter and his wife said, you have to make peace with her. She represents women and young women, you can't misbehave like this. You have to, you know, I was not wanting to have a continued feud. And in the end, neither was Al Simpson, who, of whom I am enormously fond and we have remained friends ever since. You know, one of the things that Tip O'Neill used to say about uh, politicians, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. It doesn't pay in our business to have permanent enemies, not at all. And you also don't wanna be, you know, sort of ushy gushy friends with people because you may have to turn on them at some point and ask them a nasty question. So, you know, you just, but the thing that, the thing that I think uh, people who don't do this kind of work don't necessarily understand is that, that they're okay with that for the most part. I mean, they're okay with not holding a grudge. They don't wanna do that, that's not, they, politicians and public people, they like dealing with the public. Well, it's not, in, it's, their you know. it's not in their interest either to hold, hold no, a grudge. No, it's not it's in their interest time. to hold a grudge, and it's not in ours. Yeah, that's right. And that's do you think that's still, uh, do you think that's still the, the same in the age of, of Twitter? Oh, you Lord, get it's... all these rapid exchanges so, so quickly I back and forth. I think it's less so um, you know, it used to be part of the, the, the media age we live in, where we have not just a polarized public, but some particular news entities are conservative or liberal, and social media is so, uh, it, it is like a, a, a fire waiting to be lit. Um, it's, it's, there are members of the House and the Senate who will not go on TV or radio, uh, they, 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 they flock to their friendly audiences. I've never thought that was in their best interest, but it has increasingly be become the case. 
that. But if you look, for example, at the president of the United States, he doesn't just go on Fox. He does appear on the, on the commercial networks. He understands, I mean, he may not like us very much, but he does understand that millions and millions of people, that he's the president and millions and millions of people will only see him on certain networks. So he may appear on Fox more often, but he does appear on the other networks as well. Yeah, I mean, you've been so up close, all of you, to, you know, so many political stories, so many cultural stories over the years. And, you know, obviously, this country has quite a, a division right now. But, you know, how different is this division when you're talking, you know, polarity from other times that, that you've seen? Well, I was I around for the Civil came War, in but the Civil War was no, no picnic. <laughs> yeah, but I've never seen anything like this. No, I mean, I mean McCarthy was split terrible the time. country that we're seeing now, and the viciousness, a certain viciousness in language and in public address. I've not seen that before. I mean, there were I, amenities. Well, you know, I always, I always think that we're we are older than God, and so therefore we, you know, we know everything that has ever happened. But it is true that we did not, we did not live through Army McCarthy. We didn't, you know, we were not, we were not working when the McCarthy hearings went. And I think that was a division that was just, it was, it was not quite as harsh as it is now, but it was very bad. And uh, I remember <laughs> I was a little bitty girl and one lady who was driving me and some of my little buddies to school uh, was listening to the radio and she just slammed down her hand and said something terrible about Harry Truman and what he's, he's, what he did to was trying to destroy McCarthy and yada yada yada. MacArthur, I guess it was MacArthur. And I said, so I explained to her why he had to fire Douglas MacArthur. And you were how old? <laughs> so I about eight. And, uh, <laughs> and so there you go. The she making got of home and journalist. called my mother and just had a major fit. Yeah. And uh, and I, my mother, my mother said, she said, you know, I I, I just don't know what to say about this. <laughs> because I basically think you were not wrong, but you were very rude. Mm, yes, <laughs> but, but you know, I remember. I also remember, I remember people drove from, in, from middle New Mexico into Texas where they could lit, watch television and see the Army McCarthy hearings. It was huge. People took, dr took sides. It was quite seriously awful, mm -hmm. I think, for the Republic, as I think this period may very well be. You know, a major difference is that uh, in Army McCarthy, I can't remember the name of the congressman, but who finally said to McCarthy, have you no shame, sir? Have you no shame? Joseph Welsh was the lawyer. Thank you, for, Welsh. There, was oh, the yes, lawyer yes, for the committee. Lawyer. Okay, then McCarthy backed up. I mean, there were other things that happened, but someone confronted him. You don't see that today at all to the President of the United States. And I think it would not, be, I, I don't believe it would make any difference if somebody said that to him. It wouldn't well, remember change behavior. The, the, the McCarthy hearings, Dwight Eisenhower was president. So there was a Republican president and his defense department and the army that was being targeted by McCarthy. So, and in those days, and for a long time when I covered Congress, not every vote was a partisan vote by any mm -hmm. means. And investigations were often joint investigations mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats. And that is by and large, not true today and it's very sad and not good for the republic in my view absolutely well are there any lessons based on what you've seen over the past few decades um that you think would would help at these times as far as civility as as far as um being less partisan you know everybody talks about the vote and the importance of the vote and so forth and it is very important and i think in the last few years people have been kind of interested in doing something cute with their vote, voting for somebody who they don't really think is gonna be good, but they think it will really annoy a lot of people. Um, you know, I think we have to just be more responsible with how we vote and try to choose people who we think will be sensible and responsible leaders of this country. And, uh, you know, and stop voting for someone you know, because they think that he's, because they've seen him on TV. 
as the star of a reality television show like our current president. But I do think that there's a, I do think that people, you know, this, this country is still in the hands of its people. And, you know, they have a vote. They can do what they like with it. Going into this election, are there any stories that you think haven't be, been heard that, that should be heard? Hmm. You know, we talked a lot when we, we started out this interview about how difficult it was for us when we were starting out. But the truth is that our younger colleagues today work so hard because of the multiple platforms that we're all filing for, podcasts, digital, radio. Radio listenership is down because people aren't in their cars at the moment. So they turn to digital and they turn to podcasts and maybe they would do that anyway. But, um, and then there are all kinds of, you know, it seems to me every time I turn around in public radio, we are trying to, to fill another void in information. And it's not only costly, it's, it's exhausting. Um, I, you know, I, when I went to work for NPR, I didn't just cover the Supreme Court. I covered the Judiciary Committee of the House and Senate. I covered, I covered in election years, I did some election coverage. And, and I covered the intelligence community. And I covered every major investigation that was going on. But we only, had, also one, right there. But we only had one show. Yeah. And, and for most of the time, it was an hour and a half. It wasn't even two hours. Now we have two hour programs, morning and evening and in between. We have a million platforms. And these, I mean, you know, I look at somebody like Tamara Keith, for example, who has little children, little children, and she's reading them stories while she's standing at a stakeout waiting for whoever to come out. I mean, these people work unbelievably hard. Yeah. Yeah, but, but to answer your question about the stories that uh, we ought to be covering, uh, I don't think we cover the Reagan supporters, uh, I'm sorry, the Trump supporters uh, as well as we could, or anyway, as well as we want to. And it's because of this partitioning, this, this bifurcation in the country now. Don Gagne told a story when, uh, during the campaign of uh, going to uh, a rally where uh, Trump was speaking, and his uh, people were had brought uh, chairs, lawn chairs, to sit and wait for him next to the tent. And he went around and he said, "Hi, you're not doing anything, neither am I, but I'm working. I've got my tape recorder. Will you talk to me?" And they said, "Sure." And they relaxed and they were happy and they told him everything that they had to say. They went into the tent, and whatever it was, an hour and a half, two hours later, out they came and he wanted to hear reaction. He went up to them, same guy, same person, and said, hello, will you let me know what you thought of it? Get away from me, you journalist scum. That's what happens. And so it's much harder to really have a, we do it, but to have a, a literate sit down with the Trump supporters who have been turned against journalists and journalism and are not and are so mistrustful of the work that we do now that they're not available in a way that they could have been you know, that our people any sources we had were years ago linda you must know that from being on campaign trips. well i yeah i so i spent that that was uh that was your thing that was my thing after well koki did uh koki did it and uh i covered the candidates and koki covered the voters and then when koki mm -hmm. went to abc I jumped at covering the voters because oh. I was what you might call sick of covering candidates, but <laughs> covering the voters is really fun. You know, you're, the, the, what we basically try to do is that we say, okay, we know that X percentage of the people are for and X percent of people are against. X percent think the person's president's doing a good job and this percentage don't. What we were trying to do was make those numbers talk. You know, mm -hmm. find some people who had those opinions and make those numbers talk. Yes. And uh, and it was it was tremendously fun. I had the best time of my whole reporting career. I think dealing with uh, you know talking to those people and trying to trying to figure out ways to you know ways to reach them. I mean, we went to things. We tended to go to places where people all knew each other, so they didn't have to get acquainted. And then we would, and we found also that there were places where people were very. Uh, 
emotional. And uh, I remember going to a, to a breast cancer survival group uh, and talking to them. And we, they, we had a very serious conversation about what sort of health care they thought they would like to have if they could, you know, if they could be the people writing the laws. And we got out of there and the engineer who was with me said, oh my God, apparently for him, he had never heard women <laughs> speak in public. I suppose he wasn't married in quite that way. He said, he said they were, it would remove paint, these women. And I thought, that is true. I mean, they did feel very, very strongly. And we got that on the radio. And what time was that? What, what uh, decade? Oh, well, decades, of course, ago. <laughs> no, it was a pres it was a it was a uh, it was a presidential election year and I think it must have been it might it might have been the first Clinton campaign because he was talking all the time mm -hmm. about uh, health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so Ms. Wertheimer, <clears throat> you're still talking to voters. Well, not not the way that I did, no. But uh, in the old in the olden days, yeah. we used to we used to go through all kinds of local publications. We talked to the local station people. We do we talked to everybody. We'd look for groups, groups who would represent issues and groups who would represent, um, you know, who would tell us things that who would talk about things that we needed to talk about. Um, and I I I remember. I remember a lot of those women. I mean, I, and people that I talked to, uh, because I remember how generous they were mm -hmm. with explaining their feelings and talking about how important they thought something was. And I, I mean, they just went right through past me and down the, the satellite to the listeners and the listeners reacted to it. And it was, you know, one of the ways I it was think a wonderful that, experience. Mm -hmm. One of the ways I think that NPR really is better today, much better is because of uh, our stations are so much stronger. They, they have yeah. really good reporters in yeah. our local stations, especially in and large- And a lot more of them now. I mean, I hear the newsroom is something of more than 400 um, people in there. And, and of course, reporters across the globe now and member right. stations. Yeah, right. no, it's mean, but, station report. But, but our, you know, when I came to NPR, which was in the, God, you'd think I'd remember. But anyway, <laughs> it was a long time ago. And, um, it was a long time ago. And if you know, is there the was some big story down. going on in, in another, in a city or, or someplace close to a city, it was very hard to get a local station to cover it in a way that was uh, sufficiently professional because they didn't have any money and they didn't have the kind of backers that they have now. Right. And now we work very hard to work with stations and to train people more than they already are trained if necessary. So the, and they have turned out to be wonderful partners for us. And, you know, they know a lot of things we don't know. So you go in, if you're a, a host, a show goes, let's say to Texas for the week, there'll be all, I think those are some of the richest stories on the air. Are, are those local station reports that are done in conjunction with an NPR visit. They're just wonderful. I agree. Yeah, uh, I, on our end, we know there's there's lots of training and lots of opportunity. And yeah. you know, it's certainly, you have hundreds of member stations now being able to contribute to, to some of that coverage. So that's that's definitely- And it does, thing. it makes a huge difference for us. I, you know, I, the, uh, I remember the, the story that I was about to tell when I told <laughs> was, was that we looked up once when we were in, I guess we were in Wisconsin and uh, they were about to have a primary and we were looking for people to talk to. And the producer with the, you know, with the, who was with the help of one of the local folks, she suggested that we look at the giveaway newspaper in the supermarket for the lists of meetings that were being held, get yeah, you know all of the, the schedule of things that was going on that week. She said that that had been very useful for her. Well, I wouldn't have thought of that in a million years. And and she pointed out that there was uh, that there was a it was ladies' night at the curling center. <laughs> and I remember that that the producer who was with me said, 
What is the What's curling, curling? syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, she, you know, perhaps she thought it was, uh, you know, beauty shop or something. And so I told her, it's, you know, it's an, actually it's an Olympic sport. <laughs> and it's people with brooms and a little rock that goes sliding down the ice. Of course, she, she didn't believe any of that. Did you go? Yes, we went. And of it was course. very interesting. And we even got out on the ice and I, 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 slid around. And had a, I, it was a, it those kinds video. of experiences. Yeah. You know, I, I carry them around with me forever. Yeah. Because people, as I say, people are so generous with the ideas and with what they care about and with, and they understand that, that our, our, uh, we will translate that into something that they will be proud to have participated in. Yeah, and, would be, and, that, and, and they would know how much we respected them and how much we wanted to hear them and to edit them fairly and get them a proper form for it. So that, I think... That's still that, it has helped a lot. It has helped a lot that we, you know, that people think kindly of us <laughs> when you're out in the middle of uh, the frozen wilderness in western Wisconsin. In I was, I'm so sad that I was stuck in a studio for all those years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, well I, I, that that way, I that you, you got around the, the country and the world that way. So yeah. I did. I did. Well, you know, when, when, uh, when we left, I was, I, was the, I was the chief reporter on the Reagan campaign. And when we got back uh, after, the cam after the Reagan campaign and President Reagan had won, the person who was uh, the boss then, who was a woman, and who was trying to be, you know, do something great for women, she said to me, Linda, I want you to go to the White House and cover <laughs> President Reagan. And it's, it's the only time I ever cried in boss's office. <laughs> Because I, I just did not want to give up moving around and talking to people. I did not want to, I wanted to be able to talk to a lot of people, right. not just the 18 people who are the close coterie of the president. Yeah. And so yeah. do you, do you think that job would be so much harder these days? I mean, going back to what Ms. Stamberg is saying about, you know, people really having a hard time wanting to, to talk to, to reporters. It is hard, and I mean, I, I, we're not having to fight those battles these days, but the, all the younger people are, and it's really, it really is very hard. Mm -hmm. But and they're out there. We'll find them. We find people who, who will talk to us. I love what David Green is doing now with, with uh, people. What keeps you up? Diners and in different places, just getting that, uh, uh, the pulse of the nation, hearing yeah. what people feel. And he talks to uh, uh, as many Trump supporters as he can find. Well, you know, today we hear a lot about fake news, and there's a couple of ways to take that. I mean, certainly the president and um, politicians use it to, um, you know, uh, take down factual reporting. But there's also just a lot of fake news, you know, d misinformation that that comes through through social media. I mean, has that? How has that made you change your your job, or or how you think about journalism and the role of it these days? You know, it's very different because on the one hand, you can learn a lot from people who are out there being reporters with no training. And they, well, just to give you an example, take videotapes all the time of encounters between citizens and the police. That was not available 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're very vigilant about that. On the other hand, those people have no basic um, training in what you're supposed to do to find out uh, what's true and what's not and what the facts are and to say what you don't know as well as what you do know. Here's what we know so far. Um, but, you know, this is a changing situation and we'll update it. Um, there's a wonderful story that I'm going to get Linda Wertheimer to tell on herself which was the day that President Reagan was shot along with his press secretary. And Linda, you can tell the story because it, it is the kind of thing where having been in a lot of journalistic wars really shows, uh, really shows through. I'll never be able to live up to that introduction, heavens. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was uh, it was it was a very shocking thing when the president was shot, and we uh, he was he was taken to a hospital here in Washington, G W, and we were all frightened to death that he was going to be that he was going to be dead. One of the things that, of course, makes one of the things that was different from that time to this is that uh, people who didn't want Reagan to be president were about as horrified as anybody could be that he had been that he had been shot. Um, since John Kennedy was shot, which was such a terrible memory for us all. But and you think that wouldn't be the case today? Of course, it would be the case. It would be the case that uh, you know that you you feel like it that that it it's dangerous for the republic for us to get on a track of assassinating our leaders. But the worst period in which that happened was when Bobby Kennedy was shot and then Martin Luther King was shot. I mean, I thought I wasn't going to survive that year myself. It was so awful in every way. Linda, Linda is failing to tell the story, so I'm going to have to tell it. So okay. the other person who was shot that day was James Brady, the press secretary to the president. And somebody in the control room, there had been reports and other news organizations that Brady was dead. And they somebody held up a sign that said Brady dead. And she was sitting in the center chair in the in, in, uh, live on the air. And she just went like this. She shook it off because she, you know, we needed to verify it. And of course, it turned out it was not true. Mm -hmm. He was very seriously injured, but he was not dead and he did not die. And he led an important life after that with his wife founding, you know, a major organization for gun control. Right. right. You're right. I didn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so much to remember. <laughs> but thank God, thank God I, I, I did it. <laughs> thank God you did because you knew that it, you don't take that kind of a leap easily. You yeah. really have to be sure. Yeah. And well, there weren't computers then. So you couldn't just go check. All you had was wires. They were down the hall. You had to run and see if anything had moved. You didn't have a reporter on the scene. Well, maybe we did. I don't remember that. I'm sure we did by that time, but it but was- We didn't uh, know what was going on is the problem. And they didn't have yeah. cell phones either. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It was harder. Just see all you young people, you have all these advantages <laughs> that we never had. <laughs> and they show <laughs> it. They use it all well. <laughs> well, you know, these days, I mean, you know, for forever, so many newsrooms are largely white and you know, lack the diversity of the communities they report on. And you've surely seen newsrooms make big changes around gender, albeit over, over many years. But are there lessons there about how newsrooms can make big changes around race now? It's happening right now with us. There's a real outreach. We're, we're beginning to count backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religious uh, racial of our sources simply to keep track of people whom we talk to in the course of doing a story. We are being asked now to keep files and fill out forms about them so that we're sure that we're getting a broader spread in the people that we talk to. I, I, I have felt, ladies, see if uh, you agree with me, that we've had a, a, a more diversified newsroom for many years than pretty much other news organizations. And that becomes more and more true with every hire, pretty much. I think that's true, but it does tend to be true. true you know, I think at the top level, it's very true. You know, if you look at who, at the racial and, and gender makeup of our hosts, it's yeah. very diverse. It's yeah. more diverse, probably percentage-wise, than the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. That said, I don't think that's always true all the way down the line um, in the middle middle mid-level jobs and I, I don't think that and I think that's true in in every organization and that we all need to do better but that doesn't mean that you just it, it you know there I we used to say there's good affirmative action and there's bad affirmative action mm -hmm. <laughs> good affirmative action is 
you make sure you look and you recruit and you find good people. Mm -hmm. Bad affirmative action is when you say, oh, I need somebody who's Hispanic. Let's get him. Yeah. And yeah. that doesn't work. It's a disservice, you know, you do a disservice to, to that yeah. individual. You did do a disservice to people who are, who are very good and available, and it's a disservice to your listeners. Yeah. It's well, very hard also for uh, organizations to keep going. And, and NPR, one of the things that happened to NPR was that NPR would go on a major crusade to be sure that we had uh, lots of people on our staff from different backgrounds and different, who were different from different races and so forth. And the best ones would then get hired away from us all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we would have to go on a hunt to find, you know, to replace them. But it, it, it has made, I don't think it does make a tremendous difference. If you were to, if, you know, if you, if, if people who are not familiar with NPRs, with what NPR looks like, were to walk into uh, into our surprised. offices, I think that they would be amazed at uh, who's there. Looks like New York uh, and City. It's, and, it, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, me too. You know, well, we haven't seen them in such a long time. We haven't walked through those halls we were all in. That's right, months. Probably not months. very many people there these days, <laughs> too. Okay. But, um, you know, when you look at the organization that, that you help shape, I mean, what do you think about its future, I mean, uh, Ms. Totenberg, you, you had started to talk about the, the tremendous coverage gains, um, and there are a lot of gains, but, you know, as far as um, pluck, I mean, is there is there some losses too, as well? There are, of course, losses, but you know, I would say five years ago or so, um, if you came to NPR and you wanted to go somewhere else, they're really, and you wanted to do serious journalism, uh, there were very few places for you to go. And that is no longer true. Now, I don't know whether um, the digital uh, venues that are now there will survive all of them, and they may shrink down in number again. But we've lost a lot of people, and we've gained a lot of people. There's far more turnover in our staff than there used to be because there's much more churn and yes, I say that yeah. in the best sense of the word, in the whole media uh, outlook. And I don't know what's going to happen eventually, but I know we, we pay better than we used to, even though we've all taken pay cuts this year and taken furloughs. Um, but you couldn't have a major news organization uh, pay the kind of salaries that we used to make decades and decades ago, you couldn't survive you and you couldn't prosper. Yeah. And so that's why our, our supporters and our listeners and our uh, people who read our stuff on in on digital and listen to our podcasts are so important to us because we don't have commercials. And we're glad we don't have commercials, as Linda said, when we started out. But we 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 need that we need all of you out there just as you need us, I think. And we represent, we hope, the best of journalism. You know, nobody's perfect all the time. Everybody screws up once in a while. And you have days when you listen to what you did and you think, oh my God, I made no sense at all. I, was in a, I just made no sense. Nobody's going to understand what I said. <laughs> and other days when you go, hmm, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but I hope that most of our days are, that's pretty good. You knew that this would happen, didn't you? That one of the three of us, or maybe all, would pitch for listener contributions and more support. <laughs> you we, knew we did it. We did it. I have a hat way. under my chair. <laughs> <laughs> Although I see the the chat, chat box popping up a lot. So, <laughs> well, one of the things that I think about, though, is I think, you know, we we obviously are part of the golden age of public radio. I'm sure. I'm not doing that, that, Linda. I'm not <laughs> doing that. <laughs> You can call yourself a golden all day. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, no, no. The joke but is, think, when was the golden age is... of all things considered? And the answer is, the golden age of all things considered was six months before you came to work here. That's right. <laughs> no, but the other thing about that is that, that you know, we did, we, did a, we did a lot of amazing and good work. And there are a lot of younger people who are doing amazing and good work today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to, you know, we have to support them. We have to, we can't always be doing, you know, things like leaning in and saying, that was dumb. <laughs> but, 
we have to, you know, we have to nurture them and bring them forward and make everything, make them work. I know they work so hard, as Nina says. It's, it's very important that they keep doing that. And I think it's, I think it's some very important work. And I'm very glad we have so many bright young people who are doing it. Well, I understand that people get really mad at journalists sometimes, but we are not the enemy of the people. If we do our jobs right, we are giving them information in which they can, which they can, that they can use to make up their own minds. Right. Well, we really thank you all for all your tremendous reporting over the years and, and your inspiration to, to, to women in these roles as well. I mean, it's been a huge thing to to help build that organization. And um, we thank you for that. And we thank you very much for your, your time right now. So um, all of you who are joining us too, we, we thank you as well for, for taking time out to, to hear this conversation. And um, we're going in this part of the conversation, but if you've registered for the, the Q&A, uh, you should have the link for that in your email already. And you can just go ahead at this point um, in, a, in just a couple of seconds and click on that and we'll get started with the Q&A portion uh, of this. Welcome again, the host of WFAE's All Things Considered, Martha Lindgren. Wow, what a great conversation. Again, my name is Gwendolyn Glenn and I'm happy to welcome you to the VIP Q&A portion of this evening's event. We're gonna get started soon, uh, but first a couple of things. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat within the Zoom. If you're not familiar with Zoom, the chat function can be found by hovering your mouse over the button of the screen. Please submit your question privately to the account listed as questions. Now our producers will review questions and then give them to Lisa to ask Nina, Susan, and Linda. We will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible. As such, if you're given the opportunity to ask a question, please do just that, ask a question only, and please don't take more than 30 seconds to do so. Okay, so with those instructions out of the way, I'm happy to welcome back Lisa, Nina, Susan, and Linda. Ladies. Hi. So I have a question coming in right now. Um, Maria has this question. If Nina, Susan, and Linda are the founding mothers and Melissa Block, Audie Cornish, and Mary Louise Kelly are the daughters, <laughs> what will the granddaughters be like and, and what's your advice for them? <laughs> well, I've got a 12 year old who would step up uh, to the microphone at, at the drop of a pin or hat <laughs> and just take over an entire program. And she says, come to uh, NPR and gone into a studio and interviewed me. Uh, and she was darn good at it, I have to say. So that's, that's part of it. But what would we advise her to do? Do a lot of listening. That's what I'd say. Listen to some of the broadcasts we've done in the past, because I think they set a certain standard, and think about ways to improve them, top them, change them in some way, but, but stay with it and be curious, always. Well, I've learned that, um, you know, I have a beloved niece who uh, I have her uh, essay from when she was about eight years old. Um, after I broke the Anita Hill story where she says that she wants to be like her aunt Nina and that she's not going to be pressured by her peers. Not that she is, she writes in this. Well, this young woman just won a Pulitzer for an investigative reporting piece on immigration. Oh, I've never won a Pulitzer. So I'm just shutting up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Where does she work? What's she work for? She's a Freelancer, and she won it. Was the first, it was book. the first audio. She and another reporter oh. was the first audio Pulitzer yes. uh, given out, and it was for This American Life. Two pieces fabulous. on This American. That's Life. fabulous. That's yeah. wonderful. I didn't know that. That's mm -hmm. great. That is just mm -hmm. great. I think that we. Uh, I think that the most important thing for young people who are trying to figure out how to get into this line of work is uh, they, need to, they need to know stuff. You know, they need to study history. They need to read books. They need to be educated. Um, there are a lot of stories like, you know, sort of Woodward and Bernstein stories about people who never, uh, you know, who just, just got in there and dug. 
Nina has never thought that being a, a college graduate was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I, have, I have about 28 or 30, I don't know, honorary degrees, but I don't know. There you go. I earned. But <laughs> Nina, Nina reads and studies more than any of us because she has all these briefs to read and all these yeah. legal papers that she has to read. So she, you know, she, she is one of the most educated among us. But I think that's it. I think you have, to, I think you just have to try to learn everything you can, read everything you can, try to be a serious, a serious person. I mean, who of us knew? You know, we are remark, even those of us who consider ourselves very well educated are sometimes remarkably ignorant. <laughs> I didn't know that most of the um, statues, the uh, Confederate officers, Civil War statues, were not erected after, right after the Civil yeah, War. But in fact, right. in the 1920s, and so, or when during the resurgence of the Klan and the passage of Jim Crow laws and all of that. I didn't know that. How could I not have known that? But I didn't know that. Mm. Well, that's one of the reasons to keep at it, isn't it? To me, it was always, it's always been the great <laughs> university I could go to because there I was always learning every day or there was somebody else around to go turn around and ask. Or I could turn around and make a phone call to the world's expert on something. Both get to do that. So to there is that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, would just like to, I would just like to make a housekeeping statement here. I, on, my, on my picture, it says Fred Wertheimer. Oh. That's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he set up the Zoom friend. connection for me. <laughs> I so I have I have a question um, coming up from Bill in Pennsylvania, I believe, and we'll we'll let him we'll see if he can ask his own question. So let's try it. But bear with bear with us for a second. Sure. Hi, it's Bill Seymour. Oh, oh my gosh! Yay! Hi. I just want to thank you for your exemplary work over these all all these years and for really creating the NPR sound. The early years were extraordinarily difficult and uh, painful, really. As you remember, um, we could have some brilliant piece and then something so embarrassing that we just kind of <laughs> didn't know what to do. But there was, the shelf was empty sometimes, you know. But you, you, really, you really have been such an inspiration to everyone and um, it's, it's uh, I thank you so much for oh, sticking with us and, and doing such outstanding work all these years. We need to tell well, people our philosopher is, thing, this We need to tell is. who Bill is. He we, was, we did. We did. And well, you mentioned his name last time, no, and, and just a reminder that, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Seamring shaped all things considered, and, and program manager, and he made all things considered. Mm -hmm. And he and he shaped the way NPR sounds. Yes. The sort of the 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 large number of women and the large number of women who, you know, just talk like regular people. And he hired us. He didn't what a brilliant me. thing to have done. <laughs> and he was, was he the person, Ms. Stamberg, that said, be yourself? He was it. That's Phil. He did. Still does, actually. Well, it's great, great to have you, Mr. Simring, on this, on this call and, and great to hear from you. So you made, uh, you made some people very happy there. Yes, um, absolutely. So I have a question from Mary in Charlotte. She says, do you think there's an unwillingness of news media reporters to actually label a lie a lie? It's really hard oh. to do that. It's so hard. You know, we really were trained not to do that because, because people really didn't tell flat out lies. And they told, they shaded the truth sometimes. They conveniently left out half of the sentence, so to speak. But I mean, the, the words, the so-and-so asserted without evidence, it's, that's all new and it's all a way of not saying lie because when you accuse somebody of lying, you are sort of sending up the red flag yeah. that uh, that you're you're siding against this individual. So it's I, I 
I am not capable, I think, of still, of saying that on the air, of saying of a public official, that's just a flat out lie. I may say there's no evidence for that. I may say the facts seem to contradict that. I may say the facts that do seem to contradict that. But I, I, it just, I choke on it. Yeah, but we do it all the time. Not that bold facedly, we don't say you're lying, yeah. but we say this was not carried out it's not carried out through any evidence. There's no factual base to that. It happens pretty much with every every report. I think we. But I do think it's fair to say that we are that there is a is an increasing problem yeah. <laughs> yeah. that we that we're having to that journalism is having to deal with, and we may not be doing it as well as we should or could. Okay. But we are, you know, we are trying to cope with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, let's see, we've got, we've got a bunch of questions coming in here. Uh, t -t -t uh, just give me a second. Um, so we have a question from Gabriella Rivas and we're going to let her ask that question right now. Hi there. Um, first of all, such huge fans of all of you. I've been listening to NPR since I was little. Um, but my question is, what is the best thing for student journalists? I'm currently at Elon um, as a sophomore journalism major. What is the best thing for student journalists to do before they graduate? I say take one outrageous and totally useless course that will broadcast, that will broaden them and who they are in some direction they never expected and she may they may fall in love with some new new subject i did with botany and almost ended up uh majoring in that just because i had such a fabulous professor i think that's good don't just get on a job track Be one of the uh, uh, poetry Liberal. is always good yeah remember they who was the poet who said that poetry consists of gist and pits that is a uh, that that's a lesson for a person who is writing for radio where yeah. everything has to just be so compressed and, and concentrated. But I would say that, I would say just as a sort of practical thing, I would say take a course in economics because one of the first things you're gonna find you have to do is cover a budget, a you know, city council budget even, cover something that involves, there are all kinds of things that involve math. There's medical math, percentage of people who die of a certain disease, that kind of thing. An economics course is a good thing to have. I, of course, did not take economics, but I did take <laughs> English poetry, yes. American take poetry. The arts. <laughs> take courses that take you to another dimension. Yeah. I would say that, you know, I think that you can't, you can't make yourself into a a really valuable commodity, I think, by just taking journalism courses in under oh, yes. school. Agreed. There's only so many ways to write a story. So I always say to people, take a couple of good, really good courses, especially ones where you have a professor who gives you an assignment every week and critiques it, like Steve Roberts, Cokie's, uh, Cokie's husband who teaches at George Washington University. And he has, a, I don't know, courses that have about 20 kids in them and um, maybe a little less than that. And even in Zoom times, they have an assignment at least one a week, they, and he critiques them, the class critiques them. I mean, it's a very intensive kind of course. Then you, you need to take your a basic journalism course. But other than that, I think you ought to do a lot of things that are not journalism and work for the school paper, work for the school, um, uh, radio station or TV station, do it. Uh, you will learn the most by doing it. I mean, I, I may not have graduated from college on my own, but I did spend three years at it before I finally went out and got a job. And I didn't really know how to write, an, uh, write a story until I had to do it over and over and over again. Some of them, <laughs> and you learn them pretty quick. You know, the basic crime reporting get, is very formulaic and you get it very quickly. Others are feature uh -huh. stuff that's really hard, big research projects, investigative projects. You can do that at, a, at, a, at Elon's school paper. You can do it um, 
you can do it at the radio station or t TV station. That's where you're going to learn how to do it just by doing it. But you have to broaden who you are. And Linda's right. You need to take a lot of history courses, especially American history courses, if you're going to cover American politics and read books. I mean, there are wonder, there's a, you know, I, ju we just, I just listened to, on the drive to Cape Cod, we listened to um, the McCullough biography of Harry Truman. Yeah. And it was, it's a wonderful book. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's history, it's modern history that, that young people ought to know. Yeah. Take art classes, please, somebody, and music. Mm -hmm. And theater, uh, theater and drama, that's another thing, Susan's. Yeah. And, and what about what about the the lessons that you learned the hard way that you wished you had known going in? <laughs> this is another question. Well, I always tell young people, I used to just tell this to young women, but I tell it to everybody now. Pick your battles. Don't fight over everything. It makes for a very unpleasant workplace. You will spend a lot of capital that you shouldn't have spent. So each time you decide to have a, an argument, a fight, or whatever about something, make sure that this is, that you want to expend a lot of your personal capital on it, because that's what you're doing every time you have a, a real argument, a significant argument with your boss or bosses. That's good. If you're, and if your boss or bosses want you to do something that you think you shouldn't do or can't do, it would not be right to do. Keep in mind that they know that they know that's true. I mean, they may be asking you to do it, but they know perfectly well that it was wrong. It would be wrong for you to do what it is wrong for them to ask you to do. Mm, I and you, I think I think in many times you you find that if you resist, they just back off because they know they don't have any real ground to stand on. So I, I would say try not to try very hard not to do anything that you will have to be ashamed of for the rest of your life. Mm. But there are things you're asked to do that are really extremely unpleasant but have to be done. So I will give you my classic example. So in one of my early, my early first job, I worked for a local newspaper and a five-year-old little boy was killed in a hit and run accident. And my boss told me to go over to his parents' house and get a photograph of that child for the front page of the paper. That is an awful job. And thank God the guy who came to the door was, the, was a priest and he went and got me a photograph. But, but that's, there's not, that's not a wrong thing to do. No, it's just it, a it's, hard thing to but do. But it's a really hard thing to do. Yeah, and yeah. and it's, I didn't want to do it in the worst sort of way, but I just sort of knew I had to. But the, the editor wasn't wrong in asking you. No. Insensitive, maybe, but not, not incorrect. No, exactly. <laughs> well, we have a, a question now um, that we're going to ask. It's uh, former U.S. Attorney Ann Tompkins. Um, and we'll let her ask the question now. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Totenberg, um, you changed reporting uh, of the Supreme Court and, and the, the style of reporting that you did, you brought the arguments to life. So first, I want to thank you for doing that. And second, do you think that, that over time, your style of reporting will continue over time? Well, I, it, was a, it was a technique born of necessity. So here I am covering this institution. The oral arguments are quite dramatic sometimes, sometimes funny. Uh, there was no recording of them that was available to the to me on a uh, or or anybody, and I had to find a way to justify my existence by covering these oral arguments. And the only way I could do it was to write it in such a way that it was a narrative, so that to make you feel as if you were there. Now, <clears throat> uh, in the in May, and we had oral arguments that were. Um, were available to the public, Aud the audio was available to the public uh, because there was no way for us to be there and, and the justices to be there all together. Mm -hmm. And that, so, but it wasn't the kind of argument that we typically have. It was orchestrated, each justice had about three minutes and they went in order of seniority. And it was 
it lacked, I would say, at least 65% of the oomph of a normal oral argument. Mm -hmm. it, it was not representative of the way it usually is. And it was more, I think, to satisfy the notion that you can't exclude the press from an oral argument and therefore you had to let it be there. But because the court was worried about being hacked, et cetera, they, it was only, they did it by phone. And the only way, they couldn't see each other. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like we could see each other now. Mm -hmm. And even that would have been difficult. But so the only way to do it when you can't see each other at all is to have turns. And when you do it in turns and you can't pick up on the line of inquiry that somebody else just raised, it loses, a, I would say, the vast majority of its vibrancy and maybe even helpfulness to the justices. But I always like you doing all the voices. That was much better, <laughs> I thought, than <laughs> playing clips of recordings of them. <clears throat> Definitely a, a stylistic thing you're known for. That way, but that's mainly because I would sort of compress it and I would take out all the, the legal mumbo jumbo words. Yes, you did. <laughs> did you ever have to, to fight against your editors to do it in that way, in that, in that style? No, because it was the only way to do it. There was no audio. I mean, you, we would go out afterwards and we'd say, uh, you know, uh, Attorney General so-and-so of the state of... North Carolina, you know, you don't ask them how did it go because they all say it went great, um, even when they got killed. Uh, but you, you could ask a question and hope to get a little sound bite for the top of the piece or the bottom of the piece, but it wasn't, it wasn't helpful, really. So you had to find a way to bring, if you didn't have the audio of the argument, you had to bring listeners into the argument through the way you wrote it and the way you delivered it. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Same thing for trials. In a lot of trials, there, there are, you know, there's no TV, there's no radio. Um, and I actually am not a, I think they, there's at least a good argument to be made that having that kind of audio available is, um, is problematic for the system of justice. But you can do the same thing. You have to do a narrative. You have to describe what the witness looked like and what the questioning went, how it went, and try to make it live. That's all you can do. And some days you make it live, and other days you mm -hmm. probably make it die. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we were trying to wrap up at 8.30, but do you have just five more minutes for uh, a couple more questions? Sure. 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 OK. Um, Let's see. So this question is from Barbara. Um, how did you balance work and personal life? Let's see, is there, I guess that is the question. How, do you, how did you balance work and, and personal life? That was the hardest. And what me. advice do you have for, for women now trying to, to yeah. do that? That was the hardest for me because I had a young child <clears throat> when I came to work at NPR. Um, and it was, you were always moving things around, the burners, you know, if, if there was a family issue, that one on the front burner. If there was a job one, that one on the front. And it was uh, a, a days and day, day after day of uh, having to, to shuffle the deck in that way. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to afford to hire uh, help, uh, a, a woman who would come in and, and watch our, for our son, take care of our son uh, while both of us were working and, and uh, get dinner and then stay and have dinner with us as well. But uh, the young women today who can afford it do that and they're much smarter about it than I was. It took me a long time. Uh, arrogantly felt I could do it all and I wouldn't have to turn anybody over to anybody. I, I learned the hard way by being absolutely wrung out and, uh, and, and pushing, people, pushing people around the burners too much. Uh, but I, I would say if you can afford to get help, do. Otherwise, make your partner do a whole lot, too. I mean, these were early days in which the men's movement hadn't uh, caught the wonderful women's movement bug yet. Things are quite different now. And I see that partners, male, female, whatever, 
uh, share the load a, a lot more than they do. Oh, and they have paternity leave too. And oh, you're right. And paternity leave, right? Is that they what you have said? paternity leave, <clears throat> right? Um, I, because I didn't have small children, I always had, I had stepchildren who were grown up, uh, but my, my late husband was very, fell on the ice and was desperately, was very, he was in the hospital for months and months and months. And then for four and a half years, um, that we sort of careened from the occasional difficult medical issues, but he really, he needed constant somebody there all the time and it couldn't be me and it was a real trial and I have to say that Koki and Linda and Susan were stalwarts in sort of seeing me through it and when I would get completely beside myself I mean they would Koki and Linda used to bring dinner and husbands and we would make up like a dinner party, but I didn't have to do all the work <laughs> because they volunteered be right there. <laughs> their services, so to speak. And it was, uh, it's very important. I think we were very lucky. We didn't know it right away, but I think we were very lucky that we had all those women who were good counselors to e each other. So you would walk in and you would say, I, I remember walking in one day and saying to Koki, I don't understand why Floyd is being so mean to me. And he's been mean to me for three days. And she said, uh, are you going off on assignment? I said, yeah, I'm going off for four or five days next week. And she said, bingo. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. One of the things that, that happened uh, to us over and over again, when Koki's kids were, were younger, was uh, that she would be gone, she would be tied up, she would be unavailable, and they would call one of us. You know, I want to go to so-and-so, and is that okay? <laughs> and I, of course, with no children, I have, I'm clueless about that kind of thing. And, but, but we did, we, we advised her children, we talked to them, we, we talked them off the ledge whenever they got upset. Um, and, and, you know, and we all waited for Koki to come home and fix it. And she did. And she did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, um, you know, she was such a, a light in, in giving us the, the, the political reports, the views into the Congress, but it sounds like she was such a, a light in, in your personal lives and, and keeping you together and connected to. Oh, no question about it. No question about it. She was. We, we all miss her very much. We really do. Well, any, any closing thoughts as, as we wrap up this, this Q&A and, and this uh, great time with you? Well, I would say that uh, one of the things to keep in mind about the work that we do is that it is fabulous to do it. I mean, I think all of us have been thrilled to have the opportunity to do this kind of work. And we have, uh, you know, we've met lots of people. We've done lots of things we never thought we would do. Um, I remember we took trips, covered United Nations conferences in Scandinavia and in Africa and all kinds of places. I mean, the, the opportunities that we have had have just been enormous. And I think one of the great things, I mean, I wish that I, 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 I have, never had the feeling of being bored, you know, mm. because even though I covered politics and I covered Congress and lots of people think that is of itself boring, um, I was never bored by it. And the other thing that was wonderful about my job was that if I got sick of the House, I would go to the Senate. If I got sick of the Senate, I would cover and investigate. I always got to do different things. Yeah. And if there's, there's nothing routine about journalism. It's a fabulous, fabulous way to, to live while you're making a living. I agree. That's, I have to say that's the thing I resent most about COVID. Um, yeah. People who have young children, what they hate most about COVID is that it's so hard to work and take care of their children and make sure that they're being properly educated. For me, it's the loss of collegiality 
it's the inability to get out and see anything into being, I mean, I've never worked this hard in my life, at least not in my older life for years because I'm up in the attic for 12 hours a day writing digital pieces and doing zoom interviews for my setup pieces for the court and 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 it, and I don't and I'm stuck I'm stuck up there in that freaking attic um and I hate that <laughs> I hate that I don't get to have colleagues that I can bounce things off of, yeah. that I can just sort of gather around the, the proverbial water cooler and have a good laugh or hear gossip or take that gossip and say, oh, what does that mean for what I do? And it, it's, it's, it, it's, I know it will be over some time, but it won't be, there's no time soon enough for me. <laughs> I will agree true, true. with everything that everyone has said so far, but I feel just so extraordinarily lucky to have been able to have a career like this. I've always been a curious person and to have the ability to get paid to follow my curiosities and find out answers and think new thoughts. What a privilege that's been. It's been wonderful. Thanks for letting us come and talk about this. We haven't yes. done this in a while and it's great. Very nice. It's great. <laughs> well, it's been a supreme privilege and um, a supreme privilege to to be able to follow your reporting, your your probing questions uh, over over the years. So thank you so much for opening up about that and and taking questions. And uh, we do have many people um, pouring in their thank yous as well through through chats. And just so so appreciative of you. Give give money, not just thank <laughs> yous. Give money. <laughs> we'll just go. We'll to that 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 <laughs> But um, yeah, it was it was a real pleasure, and um, I hope you have a good night and and good luck to you. We Thank will. You, Lisa. Thank you so much for having us.